Welcome to the Touch MBA Admissions Podcast. Do you need help figuring out which schools to apply to or how to get into the world's top MBA programs? Hey, you're not alone. Join thousands of others on this podcast and on our site, touchmba.com, as they seek the admissions edge. And now, here's your host, Darren Joe. Hey, what's up, guys? This is Darren here. Welcome to the show. I just spent the last week in Shanghai, China. I was actually at the SEBS pre-MBA boot camp. SEBS uh, is the number one ranked MBA program in mainland China. It's a top 15 program by the Financial Times worldwide. And uh, I was lucky to be invited to participate and to observe, to really understand what that experience is like. I got a chance to meet uh, lots of really promising, bright applicants and future applicants participate in a number of classes, company visits, etc. But what I thought I'd do in this podcast is kind of step back and share three overlooked aspects of the MBA experience uh, that I think more applicants need to consider. So this podcast is not just for those of you interested in SEBS, but uh, for all applicants when you're considering which schools to apply for and, and to attend. I realized after being in that intense boot camp setting how important these three factors were to make sure that you have an enjoyable uh, MBA experience. So let's get straight to them, all right? The first is the classroom. Now, obviously you're going to get an MBA because you're getting a graduate level business education, but I think often the professors get overlooked and how important they are to your MBA experience. In fact, one of the professors of strategy had a great quote that really stuck with me, and that was, you don't go to an MBA to learn facts, but you go to get an MBA to debate implications. The idea here is that, especially in a very interactive classroom setting, in in a case-based settings, the discussion is completely open-ended. So professors are so important in terms of not only the academic knowledge and expertise that they bring to the class, but also their experience teaching, their passion and energy about the subject, their current industry insights and connections that they have. So this professor of strategy, for example, works with a lot of Chinese companies that are up and coming, helping them with their positioning and their strategy. And he had a lot of great anecdotes to share with the class. So I think it's really important when you're choosing schools is to look at who will be teaching your, your classes because look, you're spending a ton of time in the classroom. This could be six to 700 hours, depending on, you know, maybe you're going to a one year program or even more than a thousand hours uh, in, in some two year programs. So you're spending a lot of time in that classroom and you wanna make sure you're stimulated, you're excited, you're really kept on your toes, and you're learning a lot. Each of these professors brings in decades of academic knowledge, work experience, and contacts and context into that classroom that you're really soaking up. So maybe a place to start here is to look at the core courses of your target schools because those are generally required for everyone to take. And look to see which professors are teaching those courses. Look at their CVs, look at their work history, look at their academic research. Try to talk to alumni and students and and see which professors they thought were the strongest, uh, just to get a better idea of who's gonna be teaching at least half of your MBA courses. Some schools have put videos of classes online. Those are great to attend. And of course, any type of sample class environment you you can participate in would be great. Another place to look here would be the Economist MBA rankings. In fact, the Economist and the Financial Times are the only two rankings that factor in quality of faculty into their ultimate ranking. Financial Times does it uh, in terms of academic articles published, so I don't think it's as applicable as the Economist uh, ranking, which actually has students rate the quality of the faculty. So I think that's a much better measure 
or more useful measure for applicants. So you can check that out. Uh, if you go to the Economist MBA rankings, you can see what students rank their professors on a scale of one to five. And I think that's, that's really telling. Even though obviously that's not capturing all students from that program, it's a good start. And that's the whole point of rankings, right? Is to compare different schools across similar criteria. So why not take advantage of that? The second part of the classroom experience that's so important is your classmates. You know, many uh, MBA alumni have told me they learned just as much from their classmates as the professors. And sure, while the professors guide the discussion and are super important, so are your classmates. If you think about how much airtime you have in a class, it's really limited. Let's take the longest possible class that may be offered, say, a three hour class. Okay, and let's say there's only 60 students in that class. Well, even if the professor didn't speak at all, and each of those 60 students were given equal airtime, which would never happen, uh, each student only gets to speak three minutes in those three hours. My point is that you have very limited airtime as a participant in an interactive class, and you have to make that airtime count when the professor calls on you, when the professor cold calls you or asks you for your opinion. And you want to be in a classroom environment and you want to be with peers that you can really learn something from that really contribute to the discussion that add a very interesting and thoughtful perspective uh, to the discussion and can articulate that succinctly and concisely, right? Uh, you don't want classmates who perhaps don't have much to add to the discussion or distract from uh, what the real purpose of, of the discussion or class is. Maybe they don't quite answer the professor's questions. And it became very evident to me that some, some of the participants in the boot camp were uh, much stronger in the classroom and much more interesting to learn from than others. So what are some things you can look for here? Again, if you can participate in any sort of a sample class, I think that's great. If you could talk to uh, numerous students and alumni, I think you can get a general feel for how articulate they are and how knowledgeable they are about their industry, that's probably the best place to start because I don't even think that a GMAT score is a necessarily uh, correlated with you know, the level of a classroom discussion. Generally, I would say that more experienced classmates are stronger in the classroom just because they have more content in that sense, more experiences that they can, they can share. But that's not obviously always the case. But I think that would be a good place to start is seeing what that profile of the class would be in terms of age and in terms of background. Um, but it's so, so important to your learning experience, you know, who you're learning from in the class and who's leading the, those discussions. And by that, I mean the professors. All right, let's move to the second overlooked aspect of the MBA experience, and that's uh, careers. Now, uh, what I mean here is that even at a school like Siebes, which is the most international business school in China that has a great reputation there, the opportunities for international students and for local Chinese students is often different and they're viewed differently in the market by both multinational employers and local Chinese employers. So I think it might be useful to uh, have a BCG, a typical BCG matrix in your mind, where on the x-axis you have international students and local domestic students, and on the y-axis you have international companies and local companies. So you can imagine that there's four different boxes in that matrix. And for example, for international students attending SEEBS, they tend to be more recruited by the multinational corporations and increasingly by local Chinese companies looking to expand their products and services overseas. Startups were another big area for international students. So I think that this matrix could really help you in terms of targeting which students to talk to at your target schools, because uh, surely there'll be a bit more difference between boxes in countries where you know, you're not speaking your native language, like in China, where, where Mandarin is the main language, um, also in countries that are more developing as opposed to developed. But still, I think this matrix will hold across all MBA programs. 
So if you're an international student targeting international companies in, say, Industry X in the U.S., it's best that you try to talk to similar students or, or alumni that had similar goals to you, right? They'll give you a much better lay of the land. And it's good to just have this in mind. Not all opportunities are equal for both local and international students, depending on, on the country. So I think that's uh, maybe something obvious, but I just want to reiterate that. And I, I believe that will help you pick better schools and pick better students to speak with. Okay, another uh, career point that I wanted to make, um, and this was made by Stephen G, who was a Siebes alumni himself and went from being you know, a video editor to a very successful uh, marketing and operational uh, executive for, for some top companies in China. But his whole point was that you are at your starting point right now, and then you hope that after your MBA to get to your final endpoint. So let's call that starting point A, and let's call that final endpoint C. Um, and the equation is A plus B equals C, right? You're at A, but you need to add some, some skills, some, some knowledge, some experience, that's B, to get to C, which is your final destination. Well, for those of you who are even considering the value of an MBA, whether you should make that investment at all, uh, it might be useful to try to accomplish B outside the MBA. I mean, have you even given that a chance? So if you're moving, for example, from, uh, let's say the education industry and you wanna move into renewable energy industry, what steps have you taken to improve your skills, to improve your knowledge, to improve your experience, to improve your contacts in that industry so that you can get to your final destination C? You know, how many companies have you spoken to in those industries? How many have you actually applied to? And I think this kind of ties back to many of the career podcasts, career goal podcasts we've done here on the show. But the idea is you want to have at least tried to take some steps. Otherwise, how will you really know what the market making power of the MBA is, right? Maybe you don't even need the MBA to get to that final goal C. Or maybe after trying you know, different ways to get your foot in the door to get to your final destination, maybe you realize you do need an MBA and the MBA will help make that market for you. So I think this is really useful kind of just street common sense stuff, but hey, maybe you should be doing these things while doing your MBA applications, or maybe you should try to you know, improve yourself, improve your skills, experience, etc. before you apply to the MBA or even obviously after you apply. Either way, you're going to have to be doing this the entire time. Why, why not give it a shot now? Um, so I thought that's, that was a really very clear, simple framework to, to think about that could help you determine whether you know, the MBA itself is a worthwhile investment for you to help you to, to get to that final career goal. Now, the third uh, overlooked aspect of the MBA experience, and this one's a bit harder to put your finger on, but it, it is so important and that's the community you'll be joining. Um, you're not only gonna come out of a school with an MBA degree, but you're really joining a family and you're choosing a family to spend uh, the next one or two years with in, in a very intense way. You'll be studying together, eating together, doing everything together, partying together. Um, it's an intensely social experience. Before the bootcamp even started, you know, students started a WeChat group and they were already talking about what they're going to be doing that week and different groups were forming and doing different activities. It's extremely uh, social experience and you're choosing a family. I mean, not just for the next two years, but really for life, right? So what do you want that family to look like? The caveat here is that it's impossible to truly predict what your class culture will be. We've all been to high school, we've all been to college, we understand that the culture of a class can be slightly different or even wildly different year on year, uh, depending on who's in that class. So you can't, it's impossible to predict, but maybe you can get closer to the essence of what that culture and that community and that family will be like 
by doing the following things. The first is the most obvious is to simply just look at the demographics uh, of your class. So at SEBS, for example, um, about half of the full-time MBA would be made up of uh, Chinese students. So your network is going to be a predominantly Chinese network, uh, Chinese speaking network, um, and that's really important to know. And also, SEEBS actually graduates the largest EMBA program each year. They graduate nearly 750 or 800 EMBA participants each year. So what I learned from that week was that the power of the SEEBS network is really in that EMBA network because many of those men and women are, are very senior executives working for uh, local Chinese companies, state-owned companies, uh, multinational companies, and even a lot of full-time MBAs were able to get their jobs by connecting with these EMBAs. So when you're considering the, the demographics of your family that you're joining, right, it's useful to perhaps look at where do the majority of students and alumni stay? Uh, where are they in the world? Uh, what's the dominant language? What's the dominant nationality? And also to realize that that family is not just your MBA program, but also other master's programs, uh, graduates of other master's programs or other MBA programs offered by that school, whether it's EMBA programs, part-time MBA programs, online MBA programs. There's a bigger family than just the full-time MBA program. Um, but it's important to kind of get an idea of, of what that would look like. That's the most obvious. Uh, a second framework to use might be to ask why, right? Why did your peers join that MBA program? And you, you can ask students and alumni why they joined SEEBS or why they joined uh, ESC or why they joined NUS or why they joined uh, you know, Duke Fuqua, why? Um, and I think that answer will tell a lot about the types of people you're going to meet in that class. You know, are they mostly concerned about prestige is that the most important thing for your peers that you know you're the number one school in the world or is the most important thing about uh, the MBA experience for your peers that it's a one-year program or that in the case of SEEBS that it has a very big China focus I mean I think all of the full-time students at SEEBS are making a bet that in say 10 20 30 years SEEBS is going to be a major player in business education because it's the top school in China and China is going to keep growing and keep developing. So they're making an educated bet on the future that this is going to be a really powerful network and that the contacts they're making now and in the future are going to be really big for them, right? So asking why people are joining an MBA program might give you insight into what a culture could be. And finally, one more kind of framework to think about it is to think of these business schools as companies. Obviously, there's blue chip companies, there's startup companies, there's medium sized companies. And I think it's useful to, to use this metaphor. The oldest MBA programs are on the US. I believe Wharton was the first uh, program to offer kind of graduate level business education, but Tuck was the first one to offer an actual graduate degree in 1900. So they have you know, a 100 year start, uh, head start, I should say, against some of the top Asian MBA programs, for example. And you know, Harvard, uh, Harvard Business School started in 1908 with 33 students. So they have a long history. Those are blue chip, uh, so to speak, MBA programs that are very well known around the world, have a long history, have a lot of resources. The difference is, that at some schools that are more on a quote unquote startup startup level, and I would say that's probably schools that have started in the past, say, 20 years, participants have more opportunity to shape those programs, right? To add their own touch to those programs, whether it's starting new clubs or starting new initiatives, et cetera. There's generally more room for growth in terms of uh, adding something to the program and taking real uh, leadership role there. At, at those startup companies in the same way an employee at a startup company, you know, employee number five would probably get more chances to do stuff uh, as opposed to, you know, employee 15,000 in, in a big company. So I think uh, this analogy might be useful to look at, you know, in terms of the size of the school, 
the age and history of the school, uh, that might be useful in, in figuring out what type of culture that that school will have. Okay, so I hope that my rambling was somewhat insightful and helps you really look at you know the professors that will be teaching your classes, especially your core classes, um, will really make you think twice about what type of cohort you want to be with in that classroom. Do you want to be with a more experienced cohort or uh, do you want to be with a cohort that is largely more Chinese or more of a certain nationality or more international? What, what do you want that to look like? Because you're going to be spending a thousand hours in that classroom. The second point is when you're thinking about careers, post MBA career options, to know that there are differences between the opportunities that international and local students can get from that MBA program, to be very cognizant of that and to really investigate those different opportunities depending on where you fall in that matrix. Uh, final point is to really think about the culture uh, of a program. And some schools like Berkeley Haas, they espouse that we're, we, we have confidence without attitude um, and they try to attract uh, students that are like that, that have that same value. Um, but again, this is, it's not a perfect science here, but if you can talk to students and alumni, if you can ask them why they joined that program, if you, you know, take a picture of the demographics of the school and consider the age and history and size of the school, those might help you figure out, get a better idea of what the essence of of that culture would be like, most likely be like at least, okay? So I hope these were helpful and we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to the Touch MBA podcast. Don't be shy, we have a mailing list. Go to touchmba.com and get yourself signed up and we'll keep you posted with the best tips and insider interviews on how to get into your number one school. You can also find us on Twitter and Facebook at TouchMVA. See you soon.